I think you're going to have to start it over. That didn't start at yeah, the beginning. That didn't <laughs> sound right. Why did that not do that? Stop. Delete that track. Like, delete the whole track. Thank you. Okay. Why is it always something different every time? Every stinking time. <laughs> Well, at least we don't make the same mistakes. We learn. No, of course not. We, right. we learn. We find new learn creative Learn in air quotes. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hello, readers. Welcome to 20 Questions with Your Favorite Author, where we ask authors important questions like, why would you agree to be on this podcast? Our guest this week is Claire Wynn, debut sci-fi author and gamer at heart. Claire writes books that are fast-paced, snarky, and driven by fierce, flawed characters. She's worked as a legal writer, freelance editor, and an editorial intern. On the creative side, she builds props and armor for cosplay and writes storylines for LARP games. If she's not your favorite now, she will be after Claire, how are you doing this evening? Pretty good. Pretty how are you? Not bad. Are you ready for our hard-hitting questions? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me on. Yes, thank you for agreeing to be on. All right, we're going to start with our first normal question, then we will take questions from the audience. First, where do you get your ideas? Um, Pretty much everywhere. Um, I, I want to say that... I get inspiration from video games, anime, um, real life experiences, um, D and D parties, LARPing, just, you know, scenarios that pop up and all the time you're just hit with story ideas all day long and think, okay, how could I make this into a story idea or how would character that has been floating around in my head react to this? And it's just, it's just kind of a lens you put on when you're working on a book and like everything is filtered through it and you're like, okay, how could I use that? How could I use that? So it's not, yeah. It's everywhere, basically. Excellent, excellent. So when you have all these ideas, how do you decide to concentrate on one? Um, I usually don't concentrate on one until I am actively working on a manuscript. It usually takes a few different ideas that coalesce and stick together. And it's like, okay, that's a concept I can work with. I can make a novel out of that. But until then, it's like little snippets of inspiration. Like maybe I have idea for a character maybe I know what they look like or a piece of their backstory but I don't know who they are and I just mm -hmm. kind of have different folders of ideas different brainstorming sessions and then once it, I fit something together with something else it's like oh that could be interesting and then they snowball and then I stick it together with other ideas that have been building up and then suddenly that becomes a book concept but otherwise it's when I'm working on a project actively I'm seeing everything through that lens unless my mind is wandering fantastically off course like it's been doing lately. <laughs> <laughs> it does that sometimes. Darn brain yeah. does not obey. <laughs> and when did you decide to write fiction professionally? Uh, I guess it's hard to say when I decided that I wanted to pursue publication because when I was a senior in college, I was kind of expecting that I'd go down the law route. I expected that I'd go to law school and then go from there. I majored in history, but I found myself kind of daydreaming, got fantasy books and all my history classes. So I was like, oh, we're studying medieval warfare today. So um, I was, I had all these story ideas in my head. I had it in my head at first that I was going to write a graphic novel and then <laughs> drawing's a lot of work. Yes. It takes a long time to write one page. So I was realizing that I could more effectively convey all my ideas just through words on a page. And I wrote a story kind of just for me. I got great responses from all my friends who I let read it. And then I was like, okay, what if I actually tried to do this? So I think it was probably in 2014 that I started thinking about like, what do I, how do I get these published? What should I do? Or should I start? And I've been working on it ever since, I guess. That's fantastic. Um, Florida Kevin wants to know, have you done any cosplay of any of your characters yet? Who I have not as, um, it feels kind of weird to me to cosplay my own main characters just because it feels kind of like a self inserty thing and I don't want to be like, oh, this is the fan fiction I wrote about me because that's not <laughs> supposed to be the case at all. Like my characters, they all have little pieces of me in them, but none of them are me at all. And I don't want to give people that impression. But I did have um, 
one of my friends who is a cosplayer, she goes by the handle H Rosie on a lot of platforms. Okay. She cosplayed one of my main characters and she did an amazing job. She's like spot on. So you can find her on Instagram or TikTok. That's awesome. We'll have to look it up. Yeah. Um, what authors have inspired you along the way? Um, honestly, the, the authors that I really would love my work to be compared to someday, but I'm not quite there yet. I love Brandon Sanderson's work. I think he is incredible at balancing Mm -hmm. like character development, world building, pacing, and it's just mind blowing how he manages to pull everything together. So if I could create a world building or a world or a magic system, even half as cool someday, I would be happy. Um, I love the, the grit of Joe Abercrombie's books. Um, I've really enjoyed Jay Kristoff's Nevernight book. I love the way he combines prose and character development and just the visceral plot lines. So yeah, those are a few of the my favorites. I'm going to have to invite Joe Abercrombie on because I have had him mentioned by more authors on this mm-hmm. podcast than any single other author. So yeah, obviously he's, he's inspired a lot of us. Yeah, he's really cool. Mm-hmm. So what do you hope readers get from your work? Um, so that's, it's kind of hard to say. I'd say the, the themes of the story are most prevalent in both the main characters' arcs. So Asa's arc, she's the, the sheltered heiress who finds herself kind of crash landing in the middle of dangerous outlaw controlled cyberpunk planet. Her arc is about uh, learning to trust herself, learning to find her own strength that is outside the world that's been like, put into place for her. It's outside of what everything expects for her, what her upbringing tried to mold her into. And it's about rediscovering who she is, what she wants to be on her terms. And Riven's arc is about finding something to fight for. It's about fighting against, um, I guess, nihilistic and depressive impulses. It's about um, discovering the people that mean most to you. And yeah, hers is about fighting stuff to fight for. So those are the bigger overarching themes. But I think that all in all, it is a fun story. It's a found family story. I've had a lot of people comment on the world building and people really seem to enjoy that it's very vivid and that was an important part to me. It was just bringing that world to life. Good. I love found uh, found family stories. What attracts you to that kind of story arc? Uh, I think it's a really fun trope and mm-hmm. it. I think it meshes well with like being interested in D&D and LARP because that's one of the best things about those modes of gaming is just the people you meet on the way. It's it's not about like being the big hero with all the cool gear. It's just all the banter and conversations around the gaming table because that's ultimately what it's about. So I think that's fun. I really love creating casts of characters where everyone has their own role and their own skill set and their own personality and where you can kind of put them together in interesting ways and subject them to different scenarios. And I think it's really fun to do like high style stories where everyone is being challenged in different ways and their characters are developing at different paces and scenarios. Yeah, I agree. It's so much fun. Mm -hmm. I always say it's my Dragonlance background, right? Like you, Mm -hmm. from Dragonlance, it was the same kind of thing, found family. I think it just like somehow imprinted itself in my brain. I was like, that's awesome. I want that. Yeah, exactly. So, and we should probably say that we are talking about your debut novel. Congratulations. Thank you. That's so cool. And it's called City of Shattered Light. You mm-hmm. see the beautiful cover for all of you who are watching it, either here live or watching it on YouTube later. It is stunning. I love those colors. How much, um, like, influence did you have over that cover? Um, I got a surprising amount of input. And I know that a lot of publishers don't give the author any input whatsoever. It's just like, here's your cover. Have fun. But, right. Good um, luck. <laughs> yeah, my publisher was great in that they showed me a portfolio of the different artists from, I think, the agency they were working with that was representing the artist, and I got to pick one of those. And then I got to see the sketch, and then I got to see another sketch, and I got to make suggestions at every point along the way. And it was just kind of like, okay, like my main character is not wearing red lipstick. That's just it doesn't fit her. She like she's a grimy outlaw. This is not really her. But they were really great and they were really responsive to my suggestions, and I think it came out really well. That's really, yeah, it is beautiful. So covers do sell books and that automatically wants me to pick it up and read the back right there. I'm like, what is this about? So nicely done. So what is this book about? So we know it's found family, right? You told us a little bit about the character, but what is it actually about? Um, So it is basically um, an heiress who runs away from home to save her test subject sister. She ends up crash landing on a dangerous outlaw controlled planet and has to team up with a group of smugglers and outlaws to put her sister back together and defeat an 
um, blood, uh, a monstrous artificial intelligence that's corrupting all the circuits in the city. So it's um, it was pitched as Escape from New York meets Firefly, but queer and female led. So excellent. Yeah, that was a question because we talk about found families and usually it's because you have to find your family because you weren't accepted by your own. So mm -hmm. I really like the um, – because you have a male-on-male -male relationship in there. You have bisexual main characters, not even side characters. So I adore that representation. Why was it so important to you to put that in there? Um, I think partially because I've seen people say that like, oh, it's unrealistic to have like more than one queer character and a cast. And it's – so many friend groups I've been in. They just, there's way more than one person in the group. Mm -hmm. And like myself, like being bi also, it's like I meet so many other people within my friend groups who are parts of the LGBT community. And I think, you know, I think it's realistic to have a group where everyone bands together, a bunch of nerds at conventions. They're going to stick together based on shared interests, marginalization sometimes. And yeah, that's what's fun, I think, about Found Family. Yeah, I completely agree that it makes more sense. You don't have to go find the family if you're not marginalized. So mm -hmm. I, I just, I adore that. So thank you for putting that in there, by the way. It's the thank kind you. of stuff I want my kids to read. And so, and this is YA, correct? Yes. What do you like about that genre? Um, I really love YA. Uh, I like YA and adults, I find fantasy. But what's really attracted to me to YA over the past few years, is I've been reading almost solely adult when I was a teenager, but then... I discovered that YA has a tendency toward um, female characters as the leads. And I think that that's become a really female dominated category. And yeah, yeah. And there's also a trend toward much faster pacing. So while adult sci-fi and fantasy is generally chunkier books, much more in-depth world building, YA often finds a way to combine world building that is just deep enough with storylines that are very fast paced and very vivid. And I've really come to enjoy that especially because often I have less time to read lately. And it's like, I don't want to spend three weeks reading a 600 page book. <laughs> it's like, I have so many other things to do, but I want to mm -hmm. know what happens. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, let's see if you could write in any world that wasn't your own, which world Ooh. would that be? Oh, that's a fun one actually. Right. Um, I love Bioware games. So if you've played Dragon Age or Mass Effect, those are so much fun. Um, that were, I'm going to be, naming solely like video games. I guess The Witcher is technically a book series, but I like the games more. So I'm going to say I really love the the Witcher games and how the, the monster slaying and the magic works. I think that's a really fun one. You can do a lot with the characters there, but Dragon Age and Mass Effect are just amazing for world building and they just lend so many opportunities for good storytelling. So that would be fun, especially because I know that they have IP and that they recruit authors to write in those worlds. That's but right. Yeah. Hint, hint, everyone out there who's listening. <laughs> By the way, I adore that you chose game franchises. Like not, you know, some other writing or some other TV or movies. It was game. That is awesome. Um, I, I always read, like as I'm doing research to come up with questions, like just from your bio, I was like, oh my gosh, I have so much to ask her. <laughs> it was fun. Um, but let's start with, because it said that you worked as an editorial intern. Did you learn anything in that position that helped you with your own writing? I would say I did actually. It was um, it was with a really small press, and it was an internship that I just kind of jumped into on a whim, and that was before I had an agent or anything. I was just like, I'm kind of curious to see how this all works. Sorry. And yeah, part of what I did was um, I took part in like, you guys know how the Twitter pitch contests work, where sometimes people will hashtag pitches. Yeah, so I had to go through and like a bunch of pitches on behalf of my press for one of those, and. Then I had to evaluate the submissions afterward and something really clicked and I was like, oh, this is what really makes me personally want to request based on pages that I see in my inbox. This is what really makes a query stand out. Mm -hmm. And I see trends and like mistakes people are making or things that are not great as far as beginnings. And it's like when I have so many of them and so it's such limited time and so few requests I can make, here's what makes it stand out. And that was what kind of clicked it when I was working on a revision for the agent that would become my agent. So that was a good experience. You're like, I really know what to avoid now, <laughs> which is half <laughs> the battle, much. right? Yeah. yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what they say, right? They, they say, and as an editor myself, I can verify that we're looking for reasons to say no. We're mm -hmm. not looking for reasons to say yes. Yeah, so absolutely. don't give me an easy no. Make it hard on me. Come on. Because <laughs> if I can get an easy no, I'm going to let you go because I've got a lot of these in my inbox. Yeah. 
especially during the pitch wars, man. You can really go through them. I had to skip the last two because I have too many right now. I can't. So, but there's some good stuff in there. There really is. Uh, let's see. Your bio also says that you write storylines for LARP gaming. First, can you tell those who don't know what LARPing is? So um, LARP is uh, short for LARP, live action role playing. And there's a lot of different types of LARPing. Um, if any of you have seen what we do in the shadows, a certain type of LARPing that they reference is called parlor LARP, which you don't use weapons against each other. You're basically in a building together and you have a set of like theoretical skills and you use, I think, social tactics. Vampire the Masquerade is a big example of one. I do boffer LARP generally, which is played with boffer weapons, which are basically padded nerf-ish swords that you can smack people with but not hurt them. And... Um, there's varying degrees of storytelling in LARPs. If you're at a LARP like a Dagger here, it's pretty much you put on a costume and go beat the heck out of each other. My LARP is um, very much, a, it's very much a skills-based LARP, but it's also very combat heavy. But it also has a very, it has a world with over 25 years of history because the game is very entrenched. And there is a 300-ish page rule book that tells you what skills you can buy and stuff. Yeah, so it's pretty involved. So writing stories, like writing storylines, writing plots is just a matter of, so it's different from writing stories because when you write a story, you're very much in the shoes of your main character. You know, okay, what would be an interesting way I could challenge them and then how could I work with them to get out of it? Whereas at LARP, you're just the antagonist. You're saying, okay, here's, I don't even know what characters are going to be on this plot, but here's a few ways they might react. Here's an interesting scenario that I want to throw at them. And here's a, Here's a conflict that I think would be interesting for a pretty wide variety of characters. How can I set that up? How can I make it interesting within the rule set? And uh, it's a it's a different way to push myself creatively. I love it. For things out of your control. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to come with ideas. I can understand that now. Yeah, so how did you get like, into LARPing? So I, uh, I studied abroad in England during college and a lot of the, the people I fell in with during college were um, that they call themselves Geek Society. So we would have anime nights. I'm not even kidding. We would just get drunk and watch anime. And then we went to London Comic Con together and they were telling me about this thing they did called Empire, which was a European LARP, which is, you know, gigantic production. Everyone is in like these masterclass costumes. And I was like, oh my God, do we have that in the US? So I went back home. And I got on Google and I was like, okay, where's a LARP near me? Does this exist? And I found this one. It was like in my hometown. And the website hadn't been updated since like 2008. And I was like, does this even still run? Is this a thing? So I emailed them and they emailed me back and they were like, yeah, we got this party coming up. And I was like, cool. I have a Renaissance festival out, but I'll be there. I'm and in. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I've been there ever since. I oh. met my current partner there and a lot of my best friends there. And it's, it's, it's really good. It's been good. It's awesome. It's so much fun. It it's is. one of those things we always want to try, but it's like one more hobby. You know, it's like there's just yeah. so much. One it's more hobby. Commitment. Yes, definitely. And that's the thing. Because when I commit, I mean it. So I couldn't think of anything I could give up right now to start LARPing. But I have to say more people know what it is just because it's supernatural, right? You know, they had the oh, episode yeah. where they actually explained what it was. And uh -huh. it doesn't mean you understand it. Don't get me wrong. But it's still it's just knowing what it is now. So yeah. did you have, like, more people come? Um, like, has there been, like, an influx? I think or? the supernatural episode was before I joined. Because oh. I'm not entirely sure when that was. I know that a lot of people that I know – Mm -hmm. at my LARP explain it to non-LARPers as oh it's like that movie Role Models and I my partner made me watch that movie with him a few <laughs> years ago and I was like what is this movie Role Models everyone keeps referencing and I was like oh actually that's not inaccurate that's it's, it's, it's kind of how it is yeah it's fun um there was also that movie with Peter Dinklage called Knights of Bad Astum. that's the one I always think of yeah yeah I was I wasn't a huge fan of the movie I think it could have no. been done a lot better but it's I mean it gets some of the gist of LARPing out there yeah yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I, we were like. We we're like, you know, this, it was really well cast. They could have written it a yeah. lot better. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The cast absolutely. was unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was my opinion too. That might be the writer's curse though. We look at a lot of things and think that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, Sadly. you know, we could have fixed that. Of course, for all we know, the writers actually being involved might've said the same thing. <laughs> the directors yeah. and the producers wouldn't have let them. Yeah. So, you have, we never know what constraints are on there. Exactly. It's not all, we can't always blame the writer. Um, 
let's see. All right. So back to your work. We talked a little bit about your characters. Which one do you relate to the most? So I relate to both my main characters for very different reasons. I would say that Riven was easier to write just because she's fun to write and her voice came a lot more naturally to me because she's the one who's like, I'm going to grab the plot by the throat and just beat the hell out of it. Whereas Asa is a lot more like me when I was a teenager. She's more reserved. She's pretty confident in herself, but she also was very determined to follow the rules. And she was actually pretty hard for me to pin down because of that, because I kept thinking, okay, what would I have done? And then I was like, no, I need to set this aside. It's not what I would have done. It's I need to really dig into her and who she is and what her background is, because she's growing up in 200 years in the future doing all this stuff. And it was, it was harder to pin down her mindset. So it was adjacent to my experiences, but not quite the same. But I would say that I relate to her a lot. She's a lot more like what I would do in her shoes in as far as the story unfolds. That is an interesting insight. Like the character that was most like you when you started was the hardest one to actually pin down. Mm-hmm. That says a lot about self-awareness, doesn't it? <laughs> and not until you're like, no, no, she's separate. <laughs> And you can finally do it. That's I, that's clever. I like that. I'm going to remember that. Um, so let's see. So talking about all these fun things, is there anything on TV that you've seen lately that you've really gotten into? And if it's not TV, if it's games, you could talk about a game you've really gotten into. I'm okay with that. Ooh, that would be fun. I don't think of what I have been watching. I've been working on... <laughs> I've been working on cosplay recently because I have Yomacon this Saturday. So I generally just throw on anime in the background while I'm working. So I've been watching Jujutsu Kaisen. I watched like mm-hmm. eight episodes last night in the background while I was working on stuff. That's pretty good. Um, what else have I been watching? I'm really trying to think. I need to watch Castlevania season four, but I somehow haven't gotten around to that. Mm-hmm. But- I don't, sometimes I skip it because I, I don't want I don't want it to end right. There's always something I don't yeah, want to end. I'm like exactly. I'm, I'm not going to watch that now. I don't want it to be over yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then yep. also Dune is on the agenda for sometime this week when I get around to it. So I'm excited for that. Dune's killing me. I keep wanting to go to the. Th- I'm like we're going to go today and then life and then no we're going to go tomorrow. No life. I'm like we could just watch it on TV and I'm like but I don't want to. <laughs> I want to see if, uh, any movie I wanted to see on the big screen. It's Dune, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. So I still want to see it. Um, I don't even have to tell people no spoilers. I mean, I've read the book multiple times. It's fine. <laughs> but I want to see it. So Yeah, I hear it's very pretty. That's what I heard, too. So I'm excited. But obviously not excited to put everything aside and go see it. But I will. I will. Um, let's see. Where were we, TV? See, now I'm, now I'm just thinking about Dune. My daughter's, like, in love with uh, Tim- uh, Timothée Chalamet. Mm. And the you know main character she's like yeah. madly in love with him i'm like oh something we can share because she's not a geek she's not into sci-fi or fantasy uh-huh. or all that and i was like oh we get to go see this together how sweet is that you're like i'm <laughs> gonna convert you that's right you're gonna like sci-fi now <laughs> um yeah that'll be fun uh let's see we usually at this point we have a quick question thing um but i find myself wanting to know what cosplay you're working on um it is Najira Hado from My Hero Academia, and my partner is going as Mirio. So she's a shockwave girl with long purple hair. She's not till in it till like season three or four. Mm. But um, then Mirio is the blonde guy who can like phase through walls and stuff. Hmm. So yeah, you they're, can help they're... me. <laughs> no, that that's the thing because that all the when we go to like Dragon Con. We're like, oh, I know who that is. Oh, I've got that one. Oh, you know, mm-hmm. oh, we've got Assassin's Creed. We've got, oh, look, it's Ezio, no less. You know, he was always my favorite. Mm-hmm. You know, so I can, like, do all these cosplays. Oh, look, there's a Mal. But then anime, and I'm like, I have no idea who that is. Right. So 90% of the time, if I don't know who the costume is, it's because it's anime. <laughs> they have colorful hair? <laughs> Probably anime. Yeah, that's that's my biggest my biggest um hole, right? Like, we all have geek cards, and we have punches in them, right? Mm-hmm. So the biggest, like, one that is not punched is anime, so... I probably should expose myself a little more. The, the closest I ever got to anime was um, not anime at all. Uh, what is it? The Last Airbender, the one on TV, oh. the cartoon one. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't. Yeah, that's the closest that I can. So I don't. So so if anyone is like new to anime and they kind of want to get into it, what would you recommend as like like a you know a starting starting role? Starting one. Something to get my feet wet. So I think that My Hero Academia is actually a pretty good place to start because it has 
a lot more heart than you initially expect. It's a it mm-hmm. has some familiar tropes. It's got the superhero school, mm-hmm. and it's got a really big cast of characters who all have different personalities and powers. And the very the first season, especially later seasons are great too. I think it has some of the best fight scenes in all of anime, but the first season, like Deku's arc and him desperately wanting to be a hero but not having power, it's it's really well done. It's really well put together. And I think that it's a good starting place if you're not into some of the more over the top anime, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's about exposure. I don't know if I'm into it or not. I might love it. Right. I might hate also, it. I don't know. <laughs> the movie Promare. <laughs> if you want to just jump in all the way to something that is completely over the top and self-aware and how zany it is, but it's also really gorgeous. It's a, it's a movie by Studio Trigger and it's a lot of fun. Interesting. I shall write them out and fine. Um, Blanket Force says that Mirio is uh, his favorite character. Mirio is so good. Mm-hmm. Yes, oh, and he says that uh, Mai's hair must be really difficult. Or Ma's hair, sorry, that's an exclamation point, MHA. Oh, um, yeah, My Hero Academia. Yeah, all yes, the hair is something. I have, I have a wig for Najira, which is like long and purple, and it's got little little purple curly things sticking out, but I'm just using craft foam as a base for it. So, mm. To get yeah. it to stay out. Yeah, she just has these two little, like, I don't know, these antenna type things that are made out of hair, but they're really small, so it's easy. <laughs> I swear it's not as weird as it sounds. Oh, no, I don't mind weird. Weird's fun. <laughs> that, that You're not going to turn me off from weird. I'll tell you that right now. Um, no, no, that doesn't bother me. I think it's fun. Like I said, not knowing the anime character doesn't mean I don't approve. I just don't know them. Um, heck, I don't know about the last thing I didn't approve of. Yeah, see, that's going to take a while. All right. So, so we do have some anime in the audience, so they know. Oh, Florida Kevin has a question. Uh, he wants to know, is this your actual first book? that you have finished, or are there any trunk novels hiding somewhere? You know, Brandon have Brandon Sanderson tells novel. trunk novels, the ones you never pull out. Yep, yep. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've got one that was, the first one I wrote was a fantasy book that was the first one I queried. That was the one I started writing when I was in college, and I was like, maybe I'll do this writing thing eventually. And <laughs> it was it was one that a lot of my friends loved. It was one that mm-hmm. I really loved at the time. It definitely is going to need a lot of work if I ever go back to it. It got some good responses from agents, but it ultimately didn't get picked up. But it was the book that made me think like, I need to keep trying at this because someday I want to put out a version of this book that I'm really proud of. So we'll see if I ever come back to it. But yeah, this, yeah, this was the second one. Mm-hmm. It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting if you go back and looked at it. Uh, some of my earlier ones, I go back and look, I'm like, it'll be easier just to rewrite. I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be like, hey, why did I think this was good? Right? It's like, I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, there was some fun character stuff. I'll use it in something else. It's fine. Mm-hmm. So what did it feel like to hold your book in your hand the first time? It was, it was pretty surreal. I have a video of me unboxing it on my social media and I had oh. some swords and I was like, I gotta check it out of the box. And <laughs> I, I knew what it would look like because I had seen the PDF version of the arcs. So I knew that it had like the little circuit printed headers on the pages. And I knew mm-hmm. that it had like the, the city overview on the back cover, but I didn't actually know how it would feel to have it. And it was, it was really surreal. All of my words just printed on a page and thinking this is going to be on a bookshelf and people are going to just be able to walk into a bookstore, people I don't know, and pick it off the shelf and be like, what is this? And it's like, it's just the thing that I poured my heart into in secret for years and now you're just flipping through it. It's, yeah, it was a lot <laughs> to think about. That's awesome. You're like, yeah, I have a book. Oh, no, I have a book. People can read it. Wait a minute. Hold yeah, on. <laughs> exactly. I was like, this is a secret. I'm not letting anyone read this except now I am. Now it's just out there and I can't legally stop my friends from reading it anymore. They're all just like, hey, you're booked. Great. You're like, uh, don't tell me anything unless you loved it. Then tell me. <laughs> what was it? I was watching something the other day. They they were like, uh, give me your honest opinion that you love it. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's the only opinion you're allowed to give me. Now, is this a standalone or a series? Um, at the moment, it is marketed as a standalone. It is supposed to be a standalone. It has what I deem a Marvel credits epilogue. So it's got like a post credit scene that is the epilogue, and it hints that. An event that happened earlier in the story is not 
completely closed and that things could be heading in a different direction. And I wanted it to stay because I think it's really important and it sheds light on some things that happened earlier in the story. But I do have a sequel written. It is an option book. It will be pitched quite soon. I'm going to send it off to my agent, and then if my publisher likes it enough, if they think my first book did well enough, then maybe it will be out there. But I have my fingers crossed. So exciting. I hope to get it to write at least one more in this series. So we'll see. Well, in the current world, you get to write it no matter what. But it'd be yeah, really cool true. if it's all picked up by the same publisher. So mm-hmm. it's a lot easier for readers to find them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's great. Okay. Now we're going to get to the fast thing. I get distracted. It's too much fun talking about LARPing and cosplay. It's way more fun. Uh, quick thing. So what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Raspberry or mango sorbet. Anything super fruity and super sweet. Oh, I love it. Good choice. Uh, what part of your daily routine is an absolute must? I go for a run every day out on the street and in the woods, and it really helps me to clear my head and sometimes focus on writing sometimes. And that's how I kick around a lot of my ideas when I'm just out in the forest. I don't have my phone on me, and I can't think about anything else except letting my mind wander. Nice. That helps. That helps. That's beautiful. What is your least favorite chore around the house? Least favorite chore? Oh my God. I don't like cleaning anything that involves me to have my hands wet for a long time. So I don't like doing oh. dishes and scrubbing things. It's just bleh. Don't want to get wet? No bathing dogs for you, huh? No, I don't mind getting wet. It's just having my hands covered in grimy, grimy water. I don't like it. Sounds fair. Sounds fair. Um, if you could only listen to one band or artist for the rest of your life, who would it be? Probably Cell Dweller or Clayton, if that counts. He's a, he has a bunch of different bands under his one name. He's a one man project that does Cell Dweller and Scandroid and um, Circle of Dust and a bunch of other projects. But Cell Dweller in general just has a ton of really incredible alt rock, synth wave, tons of music that has inspired me. It has a very sci fi feel to it. I love it. That's a clever choice. You can still have variety with one artist. Mm-hmm. That's a good choice. Coffee or tea? I like both. I drink coffee more often, though, just because it's more of a kick. I can understand that. Um, cats or dogs? Definitely dogs. Definitely dogs. And mm-hmm. finally, where can fans find you and your work? Uh, I can be found. My Instagram is Claire Wynn Author or my my cosplay Instagram is Phazon Pixie, P H A Z O N from Metroid. Um, I can be found on TikTok, also Claire Wynn author. My Twitter is Atomic underscore Pixie because I don't feel like changing it to something more professional. And I have a Facebook page. <laughs> You're a writer, a, that's fine. What are you talking about? I mean, about? I was just like, I don't want to just be all writer all the time because I had this Twitter since before I was doing author stuff. And then my Facebook page, which I don't use quite as much, is also Claire Wynn author. So when in doubt, just look up Claire Wynn author. And you'll pop up. And that's Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E for all your yep. uh, all the listeners out there. W-I-N-N. Um, and W-I-N-N. That's right. She wins with two N's. So excellent, excellent. So thank you. Now, everyone, now that Claire is your new favorite author, please make sure to review her book. And please review us wherever you get your podcast. You can also follow us on Twitch or subscribe to us on YouTube so that you don't miss any of our amazing content. Uh, We want to thank our subscribers, Dave and Helen. Thank you so much for supporting us and help getting these lights on. And actually, I want to thank everyone for listening and uh, helping our authors by getting their books. You are amazing. Thank you for being here. And we will not see you next week. We're taking next week off. We've got other obligations, but we'll be here the week after. We'll see you then. Thank you so much for having me on. (laughs) 